Okay, so good old Skywatch TV with our Krista Mesafarians, that is to say pretend Christians that are really, honestly, Masons that worship Lucifer as Luciferians are pretending to give you the gospel, and they've spent quite a few years now with really enriching and working on relationships with people one-sided through through YouTube and through their different avenues of how they get their broadcast across through lots of books. And, you know, for a while they were really holding solid, but as of recent, there has just been a lot of weirdness uh, involving various doctrines that do not comport to the Bible that they have been using with their network of relationships and guests that they've had. And now, kind of straight from the poisoning of the well itself, Skywatch, uh, my husband brought to my attention, which I am just so irritated and ill. Uh, they now have Dr. Michael Heiser, <coughs> excuse me, uh, taking us further down the Stranger Things rabbit hole week two, which they just did this broadcast December the 22nd. And there were nearly 14,000 views and this too they also turned off comments so that people could not um talk about how satanic and luciferian this is so we know what the scriptures say about these sneaky people that will you know push their way in creep in jude second peter they both warn and talk about it. Paul talked about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they will bring forth another gospel. He talked about that in Galatians 1.8. He wasn't joking. People go to hell over this kind of a thing. It's not funny. And yet you have men that are writing books that are supporting this idea but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than the one that we have preached unto you let him be accursed i mean it's a big deal <coughs> we have talked about the evil would use the church and it would bring forth another jesus if he that comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit from the spirit realm, Michael Heiser, which you have not received, or another gospel, which we have not accepted, you might well bear up with him. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. And so this man is a bot man, and Skywatch is helping to sell his wares, sell his books. And they want you to believe that you can find the gospel in Stranger Things, <coughs> which investigating the writers, as you investigate them, you begin to find out they're not Christians. So how are they going to implant the gospel in something that is occultic? in nature and that Christ told the church of Thyatira that she was getting into the, the deeper things of Satan. There is a point of no return. There is a place that the pseudo church can go that God doesn't like it. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, <coughs> that I, I will not impose any other burden on you. Um, it's not a good thing, those deeper things of Satan. Nevertheless, hold fast to what you have until I come. And there is an end times application of this. There is a threat, not coming from me, but coming from Christ for those that are playing around with the deeper things of Satan. Let's find out what he means. 
deeper things. Bathus. Depths of the early morning while still very early, profound. I guess it just is the opposite of the simplicity found in the gospel. <clears throat> the gospel as told you by the Bible. Wish we had a little bit more information to, to go on with that. Uh, but really, <laughs> the adversary of Chaldean origin corresponding to the accuser, the devil. But God has revealed it to us by the Spirit, and the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Look at that. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. And what is he talking about with regard to that specifically? A denial of the truth, among other things. Disorder every evil practice. The natural man does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, for he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Well, Michael Heiser and others, I found an article, we'll look at that in a little bit. They believe that this occultic New Age program. Uh, can bring you the gospel, the th deeper things of God. But according to the Bible, yeah, it don't work that way. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Foolishness. So is God using unbelievers to get across the gospel to believers, as Michael says so? No. Now, the Spirit expressly states that in latter times, some will abandon the faith, abandon the faith. Maybe we should put in brackets like some <coughs> who you watch on Skywatch TV, some who you watch on YouTube, some who get all the book deals, some who are filthy, stinking, rich and well known in the Christian world. We could put all those things in brackets will abandon the faith to follow deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Does that make sense now? Jude one nineteen says, There are ones who cause divisions, who are worldly and devoid of the spirit. They're pretenders. They're liars. We've talked about this before. They have these feigned words, these plastic words <laughs> in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow after their own ungodly desires and they will write books you could put that in brackets they will write books to give you a pseudo gospel that will lead you into the occult and into gross error, into the spiritual forbidden realm. And they will make lots of money doing it because you're familiar with their name and their work and their books and their interviews. Unbelievable. The wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Look at that. The stranger things teaching people how to be born again. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, can't even participate in it. So last verse, and we've talked about it before, but it bears repeating in Jude 1, uh, 4, it says, For certain men have crept in among you unnoticed, ungodly ones, 
who were designated long ago for condemnation. And they turn the grace of our God into a license for immorality. And they deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what he does. And then when he puts in this, you know, flipping upside down stranger things, that's that's a move straight out of Satanism and Crowley to either flip something upside down like you see in so many Ariana Grande products. They flip her upside down and they flip words upside down or in Crowley, they just run it um, backwards. So that's kind of a calling card of the evil ones specifically. And it very well could be a play on some aspect of the typography or whatever you want to call it uh, of that show. But I don't care. And so he does want to turn the world upside down by playing with the gospel. And whoever, you know, matriculates over to that, he's perfectly happy to uh, draw them away because he's a big giant liar. Who's this? Is this his wife? Like, buy my husband's junk. We need to make more money. Buy all of my husband's junk. Drina Heiser. The lack of loyalty towards Jesus is shocking. You are not crucified with Christ if your husband <coughs> is selling a false gospel. All right, that's cute. I'll give you that. So she's selling all of his stuff. What? I don't care what, uh, uh, what is that? That looks really demonic. What? Oh my goodness. What is this? Awakening. Hmm. I don't know what's going on with that. I know that's a big buzzword in the new age. Um, when God talks about awakening, he's talking about the dead coming to life. Just so you know. Wh what is this? This is weird. Chronicles of the Watchers. Like, what are they doing with this? He looks like a good Christian man. Sure. What is this? Okay. Okay. That's stupid. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just kind of interested in, like, what is the angle with this book that Michael Heiser's... Oh, hey. Wife is promoting. Um, so he writes Christian fiction. Godwa. Godwa. Ooh. Oh, my. 
Yeah. You just can't tell with people anymore. Mm. I don't know. You know, the internet is it's like an endless, endless thing. You can just go from one thing to the next to the next. I don't know if I would want to sit and, and like engage my brain in this stuff. The Gods of the Nations at War, Chronicles of the Watchers. There's that book we just looked at. The Spiritual World of Jezebel and Elijah. Psalm 82. I guess this is the fiction that he wrote after her husband's nonfiction. The Spiritual World of Ancient China and the Bible. What is that, Quinn or something? I don't know. I don't know. Movies. Like, how good is it to, like, suck down this constant vein of evil through fables? I just... <coughs> excuse me. I just think it's strange. Noah Primeval. Okay. The Visitation. Okay. Get rich quick. This is just really smarmy. That's what his wife wants to promote. Okay. So I wanted to show you. Let me get to it. So if you go over to Relevant Magazine, uh, it, too, says the same thing that Michael says, but actually back in October 27th of 2015 by Wesley Walker, the deep meaning behind Netflix, hottest show. I feel like Kaiser, like, uh, copied this, the gospel. Yeah. Theologian and social critic Peter Latehart says the devil has no stories. Devil has no stories. In part, he means that stories, no matter how spooky or tragic or family-friendly, borrow elements from a deeper, truer story. Oh, here we go. Here we go. During the past couple months, you've probably heard a lot about and definitely watched, no, the Netflix sensation Stranger Things. <coughs> it's a hit show written by the Duffer Brothers, starring Winona Ryder bunch of other people. There's a reason the story attracts so much buzz and seems to resonate with so many, whether they realize it or not. Uh -huh. Here we go. <laughs> Stranger Things reminds us that God's story of salvation is the original template for all human stories. Where's that in the Bible? That's not true at all. There's God's story and then there's mythos. And fables that come from the vain imaginations of people's hearts. So that's a lie. It's full of metaphors, symbols, and even veiled references to the most compelling story in the universe, the gospel. And then spoilers ahead, like I care. Totally don't. Hidden symbols. The show's protagonist is a little girl named Eleven. She's... <laughs> she... She... This child, she is pretty clearly a Christ figure, and her nickname L even means God, so a incarnate little girl child Christ. <coughs> and she has a mysterious birth story, and her true father is never mentioned, even though her mother does make an appearance. Uh -huh. And she possesses seemingly miraculous telekinetic powers. 
from the occult. While in captivity, government officials tempt her <coughs> okay to use her powers to kill a wet, which she refuses to do. Are you serious? Paralleling Satan's temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. You know the part where Satan tempted Jesus to kill a cat in a government uh, captivity? Oh my. These people will sell you any sort of idea. <sighs> the world of stranger things resembles the Christian understanding of our world through the occult lens. It has two interconnected dimensions. The first is the idyllic world of the 80s. Was the 80s idyllic? Filled with nostalgia that almost immediately causes viewers to long for a simpler time. Were the 80s a simpler time? Thinking hair bands here. The second is the upside down world is described as a world of death. The air is toxic. It's filled with predatory monsters or at least one who feed on flesh it even acts as a sort of prison for will a kid brought to the upside down by a monster yes i remember that clearly in acts 19 19 19 <sighs> the world heavily recalls the christian understanding of our world on one level the world is beautiful because it's god's creation but on another, it is terrifying because of its fallen state. Okay. In his book, The Doors of the Sea. Oh, you are not going to go there. Where was God in the tsunami? Eastern Orthodox philosopher David Bentley Hart explains the recall this way. The Christian would see two realities at once, one world within another, one world as we all know it, and in its beauty and terror, grandeur, and dreariness, delight, and anguish, and the other world in its first ultimate truth, not simply nature, but creation. Okay, is there a distinction between nature and creation? Nature is creation, creation is nature, but an endless sea of glory and glory radiant with the beauty of God in every part, innocent of all violence. But that's not the mixture that we see today. Everything has been touched and tainted by the curse, and the only thing that hasn't been is Christ and the Holy Spirit that fills us, and we have to be patient waiting through the curse for the next installment of God's plan. So this is more like duality, which Christianity does not follow duality. Duality has to do with masonry. To see it this way is to rejoice and mourn at once, to regard the world as a mirror of infinite beauty, but as glimpsed through the veil of death. It is to see creation in chains. That's temporary, but beautiful as in the beginning days. No, most certainly not beautiful as in the beginning days. The beginning days of that first seven days that he called out were unique and beautiful and untouched and unscathed. And then the curse. When Elle escapes from the government captivity, she spends time with a group of lovable losers. Oh, boy. Like, kind of like the 12 disciples. But in this case, it was only like three or four. So, you know. A group composed of those who hated. Oh, good grief. Matthew, the tax collector, or of a low station fisherman. Well, you know what? Without your fish, you'd be very hungry. Elle even puts on Mike's sister's clothes, which alludes, I think, to, to the incarnation, a, a, a wardrobe change. Oh, my. Torture scripture indicates the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. I mean, this is this is kind of like how the shack made room for this type of nonsense. So this little girl, 11 year old is now God omnipotent in the flesh. And that's totally awesome because they're saying it's Christian. Oy. And that's not all. 
Elle fails to meet the expectation of her friends because she does not rescue their friend Will from the upside down the way they expected, and as a result, the group rejects her. <laughs> you almost can't help but notice the similarities by the way that Jesus was rejected by the Jewish religious leaders. Well, they were unbelievers because he did not meet their messianic expectations. Elle spends time in the wilderness where she's sustained by Ego Waffles? Oh, no, you did not. <laughs> A pretty clear allusion to the man <laughs> sent to Israel from God <clears throat> while they were in the wilderness and prefigured the idea of communion. I will never look at Ego Waffles the same way again. You are a psychopath. Communion. Oy. Supernatural battles. We see two forces of evil. The first is the government forces hunting L. The second is the bloodthirsty monster from the upside down world that hunts both human and animal, showing the evil penetrates our reality. So far, it even hurts the natural world. Both forces are emblematic of the powers. Get rid of you. And elemental forces. Grab some scripture and put it in there. And he did. Um, that is not what the Bible is talking about. This stuff is wicked evil. <coughs> okay. In one striking scene, Elle finds the monster through her telekinetic telekinetic ability. That's new age. Laying in a cruciform position in a pool. She defends in a mental abyss where she comes face to face with death and the monster. In a moment of fear, she cries out for God and Winona's character responds, I'm here with you. What is that supposed to mean? This is like some weird Femi father Femi Christ? This is not of God. It's a beautiful moment that, oh, he did not just go there. This total heretic reflects the unity of father and son. Are you kidding? So we have God the mother and God the daughter. That's what they're saying. Wow. Wow. Sheriff Hopper takes on the role of Judas striking a deal with the government. He divulges Elle's location. They come for in the darkness of night with weapons drawn like a mob who came for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, this is what the secular writers and New Age writers uh, have for you. Unbelievable. Matthew, and then they give scripture, her friends boisterously but unsuccessfully attempt to defend her. So they just turn Christ into a girl. Throughout the series, Elle performs miraculous salvatic acts that cause her to bleed from the nose. The foreshadow, these foreshadow the finale where Elle, bloodier than ever, wages a battle against an insatiable beast, hunting her friends in order to save them from death. She has to lay down her own life. This is so blasphemous. Only through a sacrifice can those she loved be saved. That's not the gospel. John summarizes the significance of Christ's death, the penalty paid on behalf of those he loves. Yeah, from hell, from eternal sin. Oh, wow, this is so wicked. This is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Afterlife question. Just like the, the Gospels, the story of Stranger Things does not simply end with the death of the protagonist. In the final scene, oh, what, is somebody resurrected? Ah, Sheriff Hopper leaves egg and waffles in a box in the woods, implying Elle is still alive. This is stupid. And believe it or not, the box looks like a tabernacle. Oh, brother. Tabernacle in Catholic churches where they store the consecrated host from the demonic Eucharist. Ego waffles people because the host is totally not the body of christ it says a few things first christ is still alive and present with us oh my word this is painful 
I mean, this, this makes the shack look holy. <laughs> First Christ is still alive and present. The second, absorbing the host is a way in which one is a part of the body of Christ. That's not in the Bible. And finally, it reminds the communicant to look forward to the day in which Christ will return in glory because of ego waffles. In the end of Stranger Things, viewers leave similarly, 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 wondering when Elle will make her return to be with her friends again, just like we, who are in Christ, wait for the day our Savior returns. That's totally not the same thing. And the lunatic that wrote this is Wesley Walker, a classic educator with classic conversations, a Sumerian, semin seminarian, and postulant for the holy orders in the Anglican Church in North America. So what is that, Catholic? Or pretty darn close to it? See, this is the worst, most blasphemous article I've ever read besides that hideous shock book. Wow. I just want to see a picture. Are you hiding, you coward? What is your identity? Is that him? I assume so. If I wrote that, I wouldn't want to associate my picture with it. That's really not helpful just to take me back to the article. With no picture. Where did they even get that picture? Okay. That was weird. Okay. Week two. What you got? Goes along with uh, a very popular Netflix series, almost a uh, phenomenon, really. The world turned upside down, finding the gospel in stranger things. We welcome Dr. Michael Heiser back to Skywatch TV. Mike, yeah, thank welcome. you guys, gentlemen. Yeah. Well, what is it with Stranger Things? I mean, as soon as it hit, just the difference in the show, the, <laughs> the intro that looked like yeah. it was coming off of VHS tape, yep, yep. which in the age of digital video yep. is really anachronistic. It's, it's really weird. Completely intentional. Yeah. <laughs> the soundtrack, the digital, uh, the electronic music uh, mm -hmm. that they use in the intro. Very 80s feeling. Yep. Um, why did that show become such a phenomenon? I think there are a number of reasons for it. I mean, it, it, on the one hand, just what it is is clever because you have the main characters who are kids. Again, they're middle schoolers in the 80s. It's set in 1983 when it begins. So you're going to have your younger audience like, wow, there's a show where the kids get to be the heroes, you know, so mm -hmm. they can identify with it. But then you're going to get their parents because <laughs> their parents grew up in the 80s. That's right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I remember so, that. <clears throat> you know, they, it's, it's actually kind of clever, you know, and, and for... I was drawn in because I graduated in 1981 from high school, so everything was familiar. So I think there's a nostalgia factor, yeah. you know, when it comes to it. I also think uh, it, it presents, again, an alternative reality. And, you know, you, you guys know, the, the shows that do this, X-Files, Fringe, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. I mean, shows that do this know what they're doing because there's this sense that even in our culture, our modern technological, you know, post-enlightenment, materialistic, atheist sort of worldview that we have thrown at us all the time, most people just aren't buying it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that most people don't they, they don't, they don't buy into this notion that there's nothing beyond what my normal five senses experience. Right. And so it, it just does that out of the gate really well. It taps into that. I think the characters, everybody who watches the show can see themselves in at least one, maybe a couple of the characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, again, they're all broken in some way. They all have attachment issues. Uh, you know, just from, from the kids going through puberty, going up through high school, and the stupid self-destructive things mm -hmm. that high schoolers do to themselves, all the way to the adults that have just... They are what they are because of pain in their lives, mm -hmm. either something that's self-inflicted 
or something completely out of their control, it's hard to watch the show and not see yourself in one, one or more of these characters. And so when they're confronted with this crisis at the beginning of the show, the one you know, kid, Will Byers, goes missing, and you, the viewer, again, knows that there's, there's something otherworldly about his disappearance, it just, again, it, it's hard to turn away from it because you want to know what they're going to do with this. Again, you can put yourself into the show really easily, no matter what age you're in. Mm -hmm. And it just, I think that's, all those things are sort of lurking behind why this thing, I think you did use the right word, it's a phenomenon now. Um, it's, it's wildly popular. And once I got drawn in and, and my publisher knew I loved the show, they knew I liked X-Files, I'm writing all this Angels and Demons stuff. <laughs> and so it's like, hey, why don't we do one of these kind of books? Because we have, you know, Finding God and Lord of the Rings, Finding God and yeah. The Hobbit. You know, it's like a subgenre. You know, why don't we do that? And I thought about that, and I thought, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> well, that's and a great idea. It brings up a good question, too, because usually you deal, uh, usually you write, write books that's just, like, strict theology. Yep, yep. And you got, you got a fiction series as well, but usually you're known for the more theological stuff. Um, so would, would fans of your earlier works appreciate this kind of book? And, and speaking of the theology behind it, what is the main theological takeaway? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think they, they will, because... If they have a biblical worldview, they don't have to be sold on the notion that there's a transcendent reality. Right. That, and, and, and in the show, that transcendent reality is more on the, on the evil side. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more adversarial. But because of the, the again, the, the, essentially the Christ figure character in Eleven, there's also a, a positive aspect to it, too. But if, if, you're, if you're sort of biblically minded, you can, you can watch the show and you can see... A Satan figure, mm -hmm. okay. The, the the mind flares is how it's referred yeah. to uh, in the show, and you, you you can see this this domain where it belongs, that it controls, mm -hmm. you know, the the upside down. It's the realm of death. It's called the Vale of Shadows. I mean, you you can see these immediate biblical connections to things, and it has you know other creatures working for it that you know interact with the the people on the other side, you know, to destroy them. So that I think you know is is sort of the easy you know, entry point, you know, for people who have read my material because it's so oriented to, you know, again, the supernatural worldview of the Bible. What the show does really well, and, and I'm speaking now to people who have read my stuff or maybe who have caught a couple of episodes of Skywatch. Mm -hmm. We, I, I've said this many times, and I know you, you guys have repeated it too. The way the Bible presents the answer for why the world is the way it is in terms of what's happening to people and the supernatural cause behind that. It's not just Genesis 3. It's you've got a series of, of supernatural rebellions that affect the world the way it is. I actually think the show captures that very well. Yeah. Because of something called the hive mind. Mm. Um, you, you guys have seen the show, so yep. you, mm -hmm. you know what this is. But the, for those who haven't, the hive mind is how the evil of the upside down works. Mm -hmm. That is, all of the creatures along with the main Satan figure, the mind flayer, they share the same thoughts. Mm -hmm. They are of one collective mind. If you've seen Star Trek, the Borg, you know, right. you know, it's, it's kind of that idea. But what's interesting about it <clears throat> is that's its greatest strength, but it's also its greatest weakness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually how intelligent evil is portrayed in Scripture. Here's what I mean by that. The high, you know, we, we, I often get asked the question, well, you know, what about spiritual warfare? You know, what are we supposed to do? You know, you've, we've got all this. We can, it's easy for us, even as Christians, to get consumed about evil and the opposition and just, just the way the world is yeah. and wonder how in the world we're ever supposed to win. Mm -hmm. And we usually retreat, oh, the Lord will come back someday and it'll all be over. Well, what about between now and then? I mean, is <laughs> right. this, right. is how this does a that real, help me out today? <laughs> right, is this a realistic thing? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, actually it is. Mm -hmm. And it's how providence works. The show does a great job of this. The hive mind is its own weakness by virtue of what it is. That is, it cannot anticipate any thought or activity outside its own collective. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when, when, the, when the kids do something or the characters do something and the hive, somebody in the hive mind sees it, it never forgets. Right. It processes immediately. And then you can't do that again because it will know. Mm-hmm. But the fact is, it didn't know you were going to do that. Mm -hmm. And this is how the show actually illustrates how the kids save the town and how Eleven is, is always, 
you know, at the, at the center of that, because it cannot anticipate what people outside of its own collective are doing. Mm. And that's actually, again, the way things work in, in biblical theology. Right. There's the Spirit of God who resides within us. There's God using people, God using his own loyal agents to do things. It, Satan and, and the other you know, powers of darkness, they're not omniscient. Mm -hmm. Now, they're all on the same page. They're a hive mind. Right. They're not going to forget. They're going to learn real quickly and never forget. Mm -hmm. But they cannot anticipate what God is up to and what God is prompting you and I to do. Mm. They can only learn that after the fact. Right. And, and this is how providence sort of ripples through our, our lives, hmm. you know, that, that we, we can make decisions. They actually do mean something. You know, it, it's never going to be one step ahead of, of God and his plan and how God is using people and supernatural agents on his side to move his own plan forward. It can't anticipate everything. Mm -hmm just by definition. And the show, I think, actually does, the, it does a, a good job of illustrating how that works really well. Hmm. So the, the equivalent, then, in, in catching intelligent evil off guard mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Bible, uh, you, the intelligent evil caught off guard by the virgin birth, by the resurrection? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's Paul in 1 Corinthians 2. Had the rulers of this world known, you know, again, what would have happened as a result of the crucifixion, they never would have you know, killed the Lord of glory. I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're not morons. They're, they're not going to sign away their own death certificate. Th to them, this, the solution to the problem, Jesus is the problem, is obvious. Well, let's get rid of it. He's right. fully human. Right. Kill him. Th yeah. We win. We win. They, they, they cannot anticipate God's plans for that event, mm -hmm. but it's actually the linchpin thing that needs to happen. They have no idea. They know who he is. They have some sense of why he's there. God's trying to kickstart kick start that silly kingdom of God idea. You know, here's the son of God. Well, we know what God's up to. Well, you, you do to a little bit, but you don't know the end game. Mm -hmm. You don't know, you know how this is going to operate. You're guessing. And that's exactly where God wants you to be. <laughs> You're guessing. So, yeah, Scripture does present us with this kind of chess match between you know, God, who is omniscient, and the other side, who's really, really, really smart. Mm -hmm. And again, doesn't forget anything. But it's not quite up to the opponent, mm. you know, who, who is God. And, and, and again, the, the show does this really well, because what's neat about the show is that the kids and the characters, to confront supernatural evil, they do whatever it is they can. Mm -hmm. make any and I just think it's a wonderful illustration. Like, it's a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Mr. Destiny, these kinds of movies where if we look back on our lives, you know, we can see these moments where my life would have been completely different if I'd have made the left turn instead of the right. Right. If I'd have been in the room for that conversation as opposed to not. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just the way life is. And, and God is, is behind all of these circumstances. He's the one who can anticipate the connections. Mm -hmm. We can't. People who are opposed to us can't. Supernatural forces opposed to us can't. Mm -hmm. This is just how providence is propelled. Yeah. And so the, the show does a really good job of bringing all that together. Yeah, and in, in that last scene, too, redemption is such a big part of it. it because is. the least likely character to ever yep. be redeemed. But that character is still human. There's still a chance at redemption. And then, again, like you said, when you look back, you can trace all those events and see well, that it brought them to that if moment. If there's one verse that you could stick on Stranger Things, to me it would be Genesis 50-20. You know, you meant it for evil, mm -hmm. but God meant it for good. Mm -hmm. Because Eleven, who is, who is the central character to everything working out, mm -hmm. she's the supernatural power. She's the Christ figure. She is not who she is unless she had suffered. Right. Even in her story, mm -hmm. okay, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. I mean, the, the whole show, the plot, the subplots, just smack of that whole idea. It's mm -hmm. awesome. <laughs> yeah. And this is an opportunity for you to use what has become a cultural phenomenon here in the United States with Stranger Things, uh, opening the, the mind, uh, the, the hearts of, of fans who may not have considered the connections to the gospel, to open them up to entertaining some of these thoughts about the bigger things uh, in Stranger Things. The world turned upside down, finding the gospel in Stranger Things by Bible scholar, theologian, Dr. Michael Heiser, along with an interview that he gave to Stephen Bankars, former New Ager and Josh Peck's co-author in the very important book, The Second Coming of the New Age, about the book of Enoch and why that extra-biblical book is so important to Bible theology. What did the apostles know about the book of Enoch and the uh, explanation that it offers for the very strange incident in Genesis 6? You can get the book and the deep in the series. Um, Sharon and I just started watching.
is Stranger Things different, and how does it present this contrast between good and evil? Yeah, Stranger Things, there's a very clear line between the upside down, which is a place that you don't want to be, again, because it's death, it's decay, it's the home of the mind flare, I mean, the, 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 the Satan figure, it, it's never presented as anything positive, even peripherally. I mean, it, it's not that you, you know, confront this or interact with it in any way that is good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Will is trapped over there. He is able to, you know, communicate his existence, you know, to his mother. So you have, you have situations like that. But again, even that is not, hey, mom, this is kind of cool over here. I bet you didn't know this place was, no, it's like, get me out of here. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm dying. Um, so there, there's, it, it doesn't ever have a moment of ambiguity. A neighbor, okay, they're, they're going to do self-destructive things. They're going to say bad words. They're going to do stupid stuff. Okay, they're the people who live next door that we're supposed to, you know, be interacting with to win them to the Lord. Mm -hmm. You have them, but that part of their character isn't anything to be emulated, or it's it's never made, you know, something positive. They succeed despite their flaws, despite their pain. They work through it. They sacrifice for each other. So it, it's Stranger Things actually harkens back to the to the, the old era of TV where people just did the right thing even though sometimes they were a mess. They, <laughs> th there's redemptive value to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They haven't been dehumanized or set, cast in a situation where it doesn't matter. Humanness just doesn't matter anymore. It's not nihilistic mm -hmm. at all. It, it's, they, they do what they do for each other, for their friends, and because they know this other reality is there, and they want to avoid it really swallowing up their lives and, the lo and everybody else in the town. Mm. Jesus said, greater love is no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. My favorite character in the whole series oh, yeah. is Bob Newby, the character played by Sean yeah. Astin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he's, he's kind of clueless. He doesn't understand what's going on, but because the woman he loves says, I need your help. He's like, yeah. okay, what do I do? And, you know, hope... This isn't much of a spoiler if you've not seen the series, but uh, the scene where he goes out, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's still, you know, still getting me now. But that, I think, is a perfect example of what you're talking about. Yeah. And, you know, it, the, the poster child as an adult for you don't want to make the mess of your life that I've made is, is really Hopper. He's, the, he's yeah. the chief of police. Right. Now, he's had a lot of suffering because he's lost a child. But his solution to that is to is to drink a lot, to womanize, to over medicate, you know, mm -hmm. all this stuff. You know, just just the typical story of you know anybody who lives next door. Mm -hmm. But he will do things. I mean, he he has these these crossroad moments in the show. One of my favorite episodes is is in season one, the episode in the morgue. Okay, I don't I don't want to telegraph too much, <laughs> but but I could put myself in that scene as Hopper, and and he knows what he needs to do, but it's like, if I do this, my life is never going to be the same. The, yeah. whole, the town is never going to be the same. And if I'm wrong, this is like the most self-destructive thing I can possibly imagine. But he does it anyway. He does it for Joyce, because he, you can tell he, he has some feelings for this, this woman, you know, mm -hmm. Will's mom. Mm -hmm. that They have some kind of history. And he, he does it for her, because he believes her. There's just this little bit inside of him that says she could be right, mm -hmm. and he has to know. So you, you, have, you have, again, these characters that it's easy to, for anybody to identify with, but they do the right thing you know, in so many instances where I can't, you know, it's going to hurt a lot <laughs> you know, to do this thing. But they do it, and especially, like I, I, I said a little while ago, the transition from season one to season two. They all know they're sort of in this club now. We've, we've been touched by this supernatural reality. And when push comes to shove, we are going to be in each other's corner mm -hmm. when it comes to this thing. You know, here we go. And again, to me, it's just a wonderful illustration of how the church should be, how Christians should think mm -hmm. collectively. You know, yes, it doesn't look like we can win. This seems kind of stupid to resist this. But you know what? We're going to do our job. Mm -hmm. We're just going to do our job. And we'll see what happens. 
Yeah, that, that transition from season one to two, and then how season two ended, I thought was really cool because, you know, in the beginning, Eleven isn't with them anymore. Yep. You know, so what does that sound like? It's right. like a book of Acts. Yep. Um, and uh, they have to learn how to kind of navigate this without, for at least a little while without her. Um, and, and where the first season ended, how it was kind of like, you know, she sacrificed herself. It was more of like a Christ on the cross type of thing. Mm -hmm. I sort of got the sense that the end of season two, without giving too much away, but was like more of a battle of Armageddon kind of thing. I mean, the this, this upside-down realm is literally trying to get in. You know, the, the mind flayer is trying to get in. There's demogorgons all over the place. Uh, and But it's still the same. Again, I don't want to give too much away, but it's sort of the same type of thing, but it's like, you know, the, it, it's like the Armageddon scene, kind of. What, what, what do you think? I, I do think, you know, that you, you have, it's, without giving too much away, yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> it's hard to talk about. It's the gates of hell scene. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, I didn't think Armageddon, mm -hmm. what, what I thought was, you know, when you go from season one to season two, it is like the book of Acts. Yeah. She's, she's not there. She's kind of there, but not there. You know, this, this whole thing going on. And, and they've had a, they've, they've all had this tremendous loss because of her. Mm -hmm. And they're fearful. What's going to happen to us now? What, what if, what if, you know, we really didn't win? What if evil's still yeah. here and all this kind of stuff? And then that emerges and she, she's then, you know, later on in the, in the season, she's present. Mm -hmm. so, so to me, that was still the book of Acts when they realized that the Spirit of God. Oh, interesting, you know, yeah. You know, like, like the Lord left, but the, the Spirit, Spirit has come. Yeah. And now it's, now it's all hands on deck spiritual warfare. Oh, really interesting, and, and yeah. We, and we have the, the Gates of Hell, you know, episode. Mm -hmm. But even that, you know, <laughs> that, was, that was a victory, yeah. 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 You know, sh she helped you win that time. Mm -hmm. but this is all far from over. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that puts us, like, in, in our situation. Mm -hmm. And in the book, I actually comment on, on season three. Again, it's really hard to, to talk about if, if people have not seen the show. But there are things that happen in season three that, to me, again, I don't think the Duffer brothers who create the show are doing any of this intentionally. Right. But it, it, it really spoke to me about the condition of the church. Mm -hmm. the, the condition of, of the kids and Eleven herself really in my head map over to the condition of the church in, in its in its powerlessness. Yeah. In its oh. uncertainty nowadays, like mm -hmm. right now. Yep. And I, I how fractured it is. How and... fractured it is. I, I I couldn't help thinking, you know, if if this is the invisible hand of God in this show, <laughs> like holy cow, this this is gonna really be kind of amazing yeah. in season four. If if this if what I'm seeing here is the actual trajectory, this is going to be really interesting mm. going forward to see what happens. Yeah, definitely. So what do you hope that readers take away from the world turned upside down? People have seen the show and read the book. What do you hope that they get out of this? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping they, they appreciate, if, if they're not believers, I'm hoping they appreciate the show on a different level. But I'm also hoping that Christians, or really anybody, can ask, open their minds to at least one question. Why is it that this story that's just so well done, and other stories that are really well done, why is it that they sort of mimic this bigger story? Like, why mm -hmm. is that? You know, good storytelling will map to good storytelling. And, and the gospel, as, as the Bible presents it anyway, maybe not as church presents it. Right. But the gospel is a story well told. And there are reasons why all these great works, Narnia, Lord of the Rings, all this, you know, they even, sh that even shows like this that aren't trying to do it, they mm -hmm. just wind up doing it. Yeah. <laughs> because, because Scripture has all these archetypes in place beforehand. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm hoping that if people can latch onto that one question, that it'll, it'll provoke them a little bit, like, why is that? How does that work? And, you know, for Christians, I think it's just a good opportunity to take the show <laughs> And start, you know, doing some ministry with their friends who may not have any interest in spiritual things but love stranger things, mm -hmm. the show. And it's like, man, <laughs> you know, there it is. These, this, it's take it and have conversations. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a fractal of reality. A story well told. Stranger Things is the show. Three seasons available on Netflix right now and uh, fourth season in production. But the deeper story behind it. The World Turned Upside Down, Finding the Gospel in Stranger Things by Dr. Michael Heiser. An opportunity for you to open the door conversation with somebody who else who has seen the show, appreciated the show, and uh, has maybe never considered how it uh, correlates to the big 
narrative, the story in which we are all a part, whether we realize it or not. You can get the book and uh, the interview, the DVD interview, uh, Dr. Michael Heiser with Stephen Bankars, co-author of The uh, Second Coming of the New Age, talking about uh, the big picture story, how the book of Enoch factors into that, and uh, where we see that reflected in the Bible. Get both the book and the DVD for your... Oh, my word. Well, I hope this has been informative, and uh, do not trust everything that says that it is a Christian because you might be being led astray by the same people that Jude and Second Peter warned you would creep in unawares with feigned plastic words to make money and off of their own desires and appetites because that is what is happening.